Blessed Christmas to one and all! This is Christelle, Verbum Day Disciple, welcoming you once again to our weekly online School of the Word. How was your Christmas celebration? I'm quite sure that however that is, there is something unique about it this year, right? In my personal experience, the stark contrast is very, very evident. For decades now, I got used to waking up early morning on December 25 as we travel to our province to celebrate Christmas with the rest of the clan. The day will be filled with food and games and get-togethers. But this year, everything was just so quiet. 
No hurriedness, no grand feasts, no get-togethers. I even had to spend it alone in my room after having to go on home quarantine upon being exposed to someone with COVID-19 at work. I remember texting my sister to ask excitedly, What's for Noche Buena? And she replied with just one word, Sleep. Yes, Christmas in this year 2020 had been quiet and uneventful for me. Yet, I give thanks to God for still being able to spend it together with loved ones despite the isolation. Their simple acts of kindness, delivering food, calling to ask how I am feeling, and getting to reconnect with friends through online means are proof that there is still that same spirit of warmth and joy brought about by the love that came down, Jesus Christ. Now, more than ever, His presence is placed in the spotlight. We are being brought back to the humility of that first Christmas night. Simple, ordinary, yet unique and very special in its own way. How about you? What was your unique experience with Christmas this year? Has it been burdensome? Or is there something Christ yearns to teach you with this unique experience? Last week, Mela deepened on the fourth candle of Advent, which symbolized love. She taught us how loving is no easy task, because real love is pushing through even despite difficulties, trials, and troubles in our hearts. The right kind of love is a love that does not only seek temporary happiness, but invests, invests on things that are eternal, that bears eternal life, not only for ourselves, but also for others. And the only standard we must have in loving is no other than Christ's love. And to top it off, what great timing the church has that tomorrow we will be celebrating no less than the feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. According to Reverend Strasser, cited in the website catholicculture.org, the primary purpose of the Church in instituting and promoting this feast is to present the Holy Family as the model and exemplar of all Christian families. And what better way to continue examining Christ's way of loving than by starting with this most basic unit of society, His very own family. So today, we will take a closer look at how the family is inviting us to this very familiar, yet also very profound, familial love. A love that, literally and figuratively, hits close to home. Actually, if we were to base it on scripture, we might encounter some difficulty looking for biblical references on the actual day-to-day -day life of the Holy Family of Nazareth, right? But as I prayed and reflected upon the Bible readings for tomorrow, the Lord seemed to unveil the hidden life of the household of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and He let me realize that there are indeed a lot of lessons which can be learned from them. So I invite you to join me as we personally encounter this holy family, as we journey with them to see their pivotal role in salvation history. And for today, I would like to focus on three main takeaway points I've personally learned from this journey with the Holy Family. The first point is that the Holy Family served as the foundation of Christian values. Jesus began his ministry when he was around 30 years old. Who do you think would have been his mentors during all those years of his childhood, being a teenager and early adulthood? What could have transpired in his life before he began fulfilling the work prophesied of him? Personally, I think Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, were the main protagonists in this part of Jesus' life. The Gospel tomorrow, taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40, is an account of Jesus' presentation at the temple. Joseph and Mary offered Jesus up to the Lord as was customary. When the days were completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with a dictate in the law of the Lord. 
The presentation at the temple is a symbolism of how Mary and Joseph as parents consider Jesus as a gift from God, and so they offer him back to the Lord to be enveloped with his loving care and protection. It symbolizes their desire as parents to raise this child as a child of God, according to his divine will. They take full responsibility in taking care and protecting this child from harm and the forces of evil so that God's divine plan may ensue in the years to come. Their dedication as parents is crucial to the salvation of humankind. How about you? As a parent, are you taking concrete steps to allow your child or children to fully experience being a child of God? And for those who are not parents, can you think of people being entrusted to you by the Lord and that He is asking you to present and offer up to Him? The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2223, also gives the following advice to parents. Parents have the first responsibility for the education of their children. They bear witness to this responsibility first by creating a home where tenderness, forgiveness, respect, fidelity, and disinterested service are the rule. The home is well suited for education in the virtues. This requires an apprenticeship in self-denial, sound judgment, and self-mastery, the preconditions of all true freedom. Parents have a grave responsibility to give good example to their children. Personally, I firmly believe that many of our problems in society are rooted in this very basic fact that not all homes consider this important. Many parents get lost in the busyness at work and other worldly matters and are unable to dedicate time for the teaching of Christian values. Instead, they entrust it to the child's yaya or homeroom teacher or values education teacher in school. With the rise in the number of single parenthood and divorce, the importance of teaching values early on has been all the more neglected and put on least priority. In the recent news, we have even witnessed how a father brutally killed a mother and her son in front of his own daughter. Indeed, the foundation of Christian values in the home is really under attack. And so even at a young age, more and more children are getting depressed, lost, confused, and unaware of the values that are meant to be their stronghold as they venture forth in life. So let us examine ourselves. In our own homes, or if we are living far from home, let us examine those who are directly under our care and responsibility. How are we bearing witness to the establishment of Christian values? Are there some aspects with which warrant change or improvement to concretize the foundation of Christian values in the home? How do we place a counterattack? on the forces which threaten our children and youth from encountering Christ. During the presentation at the temple, Mary and Joseph encountered Simeon, a righteous man who upon seeing Jesus exclaimed, He will be a sign from God which many people will speak against, and so reveal their secret thoughts. And sorrow, like a sharp sword, will break your own heart. As we read between these lines, we see that indeed, Simeon's prophecy holds true throughout Jesus' life. Jesus' holy family was not freed from the sufferings and trials encountered by any ordinary family. We know that perhaps in every family, there is some degree of brokenness. Some of us are wounded by the sin of our own kin. Sometimes we ourselves inflict those wounds to our loved ones. Some of us experience separation and even betrayal. More especially during the time of lockdown, wherein we have more exposure to one another in the household, we experience this brokenness daily as we say and do things which hurt, irritate, frustrate, disappoint, anger, and sadden one another. Yet we are reminded by the Holy Family that they too have gone through the same. They were exiled, persecuted, driven by extreme poverty. They were anxious when they lost Jesus in the temple. And so, we share the sharp sword which pierces our heart, just as Simeon prophesied. 
this for me symbolizes that great sacrificial love that we have to endure in our own family life. The Holy Family is reminding us to have patience with each other's faults and readiness to forgive and to reconcile. This is something which parents must especially model for their children, which they cannot read in any book or cannot be taught in any school. Similarly, there must be proper care and respect given by children to their parents and grandparents, even after they grow up and leave home. This was our father's reminder in the first reading tomorrow from the book of Sirach. My son, take care of your father when he is old. Grieve him not as long as he lives. Even if his mind fail, be considerate of him. Revile him not all the days of his life. Kindness to a father will not be forgotten, firmly planted against the depth of your sins, a house raised in justice to you. Some of us may find this difficult, especially if we have had family members who were abusive, who mistreated us or manipulated us, or tricked us. We probably have a lot of hurt today. Yet, God knows about that hurt. God cares about that hurt. And God understands why you hurt. As in all relationships, in the parent-child relationship too, there needs to be love, repentance, and forgiveness on both sides. Both parent and child should be able to say, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And both the parent and the child should be able to say, You are forgiven. Jesus becomes truly present in a family when all the members live in the Christian spirit of sacrifice despite the hardships and trials. This happens when there is mutual understanding, mutual support, and mutual respect. The last lesson I would like to take away from the Holy Family is having obedience as a central part of the household. Joseph, the carpenter of Nazareth, is presented as a man of unwavering obedience, eager to consult God in per fervent prayer and to learn his will through dreams. Joseph obeys without complaint. He took Mary as his wife, even though she bore a child out of wedlock. He led the family to Egypt while they were being persecuted by King Herod, and he brought back the family to Nazareth. His prompt obedience is crucial to God's plan. When God warns him of threats to his family, Joseph is quick to follow his direction in order to protect him. This is a good lesson for us in today's world, in which our families are being gravely threatened. There are many forces which are seeking to harm our families, especially through the means of entertainment and social media. We need to be constantly alert, like Joseph listening for the direction of the Lord as we discern how to keep our family safe from destructive influences. He knows nothing except the next step of the journey, but he takes that step. So also is our obedience crucial to God's plan. We cannot see the fullness of God's plan for our lives or our families, but like Joseph, we can be assured that our faithfulness will also lead, one step at a time, to greater things. Jesus, on the other hand, despite being divine, submitted to his human parents ever so willingly. All those years he might have been working in the shop with Joseph. That's why he was referred to as the carpenter's son. Likewise, we must obey our parents not because they are the wisest and the most virtuous of all human beings, but because they are the parents God has given us, and the command to obey is his. From Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So let us ask ourselves, are we promoting obedience as a central part of our family? In what ways can we cultivate this culture among our kin and among those under our care? Lastly, let us also keep in mind that God is also asking us to extend the boundaries of our family. The homeless man or woman is part of our family. The drug addict living in fear and loneliness is a member of our family. The sick, the dying, those who are dirty and obnoxious are members of our family too. 
And together let us pray. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, we invite your holy family into our homes. Knowing that you are concrete people who understand our struggles and will forever intercede for us, may you grace us with the values you have established, which are indeed worthy of safekeeping and reverence. Please guide us and lead us to be ever more open and attentive to your example, as we strive to make our homes, like that of your holy family, true schools of faith and prayer. Amen.
As we end this moment of prayer, we are invited to offer our thanksgiving prayer in writing in the comment section. Also, we are invited to carry a concrete person in prayer through this week, praying for their situation that they are living and also for one another. To be living witnesses of hope and love as Vavom Day. With you by my side. In the four walls of my room, I search for who I am. There is no music, no laughter, no voice heard. There is only the unwanted part of me. I walked out of the room, hoping to discover the real me, the laughter of people, friends walking together. As I try to discover and find myself, I get to know and learn about you. You showed me the better version of me. Life is beautiful and lived with love. In the four walls of my room, now I see the real me, joyfully living the true meaning of life with you by my side. This is not because of me, but of your loving ways. Without you, I am nobody. Some friends and relatives have come and gone. Learning about the real me, the fibromyalgia and disability. You stayed by my side. Took my hands and walked with me. I live alone, but not really. For you are always there. Make me laugh when I feel alone. You have wiped the tears of sadness, making me see the sunrise and sunset. Pain is no longer frustration, experiencing and facing it every day. For you are there always, giving your warm embrace. In the four walls of the room, the voice of laughter echoes. Music is once again heard as I dance and stomp my feet. It is wonderful to celebrate, give thanks for the day. No longer searching, moving forward. Continue walking this life's journey with all the challenges. It is possible 
for you are always there, loving unconditionally and accepting me. You willingly come into our hearts, despite our tools. Being born in our humble cradle is your unconditional love for us. I am not worthy for you to stay. He said, My child, I will always be by your side. Life is truly worth living, for you are there. I liken myself to Simeon in our gospel reading today. Though I am not as righteous and devout like him, I am very much like him in his desire to see salvation before departing from this worldly life. I would always say in prayer that I desire to go straight to heaven without making a long stopover in purgatory. I am so in awe and inspired by what I have learned about the reality of heaven and of what awaits us in paradise. But based on what I read about how the saints lived, I know that I still have a long, long way to go before I reach perfection in holiness in my lifetime. I understand that a person perfected in holiness and righteousness is no longer capable of committing mortal nor venial sins. It is still a struggle for me to be Christ-like to some persons whom I believe God has entrusted to me. Those whom I am closely working with are employees and those I am closely related to my brothers in particular, I find them very challenging to journey with. There are times when I feel like I don't want to have anything to do with them, and sometimes I am even on the verge of bargaining with God to give me a different assignment. But upon reflection, I realize that I always ask the Lord in prayer to make me an authentic disciple and a strong spiritual warrior. Now he brought into my life these difficult persons to test me. For how will I know that I have acquired the virtue of humility if I have not experienced insults and rejections? How will I know if I have acquired the virtue of patience if I have not experienced defiance and displeasure? How will I know if I have been truly merciful forgiving and loving to my enemies, if I have not experienced being betrayed or treated badly. In hindsight, I think that the Lord did answer my prayer by entrusting to me these persons whom I find unlikable and unlovable, so I will strip off my pride, anger, impatience, self-righteousness, and unforgiveness. On some occasions, I would come out victorious when my humility and patience are tested. That is when I am moved to understanding and compassion instead of becoming hateful and judgmental. Other times I fail when I give in to anger and resentment. I know that God sees my desire to be pleasing to Him. He is patient. I am his work in progress. I believe that what is important is the realization that I should be thankful for the persons he has entrusted to me and see them as blessings because actually they are training me to holiness and righteousness. As we close the year 2020, a year like no other, as we are battered by the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, a series of destructive natural calamities that came in our country one after another, and severe persecution of the Catholic Church worldwide, I believe that there are still many things to be thankful about. The scenario invites desolation, but for me, it is during these gloomy times where I felt that the Lord has invited me to shine as a disciple, and I have to step up to the call. My husband and I labored to keep our small business afloat, 
We used our humble enterprise to contribute to the relief efforts of our parish church and other religious institutions for the victims of the Taal Volcano eruption, those severely affected by the COVID-19 crisis and the strong typhoons. Despite the busyness of work, it was also during this time that I was inspired to share more articles on my FB page and took it as an opportune time to evangelize our employees. I felt that, more than ever, this is the time to strengthen our faith and devotion, to be more prayerful, to give hope in the midst of uncertainty, to remain courageous in facing these trials, to know God more, to immerse in His Word, and to be reminded of God's promises and His great love for us. I can say that in our place of work, our efforts are slowly bearing fruit, as we can see that some of our employees are now sharing online masses and prayers and listening to homilies and worship songs instead of their usual pop songs. It may be the free internet load that we gave them which prompted the initial motivation, but I do believe that some of them have already been truly touched by the Holy Spirit. As we celebrate today the Feast of the Holy Family, I would like to shower God with praise and thanksgiving for blessing mankind and myself in particular with the gift of family by blood and the gift of family by choice. The family which blossomed out of love and is nurtured and sustained by love. I cannot imagine the world without it. Truly, God is great.